Out of the six children I have, out of all of them, they all love it to some respect, but none of them are uh, even remotely as addicted to pool as I was. <laughs> I'm moving, Jeanette. Can I move? Yeah, I know. I'm just going to move to Tampa. Welcome to Bitch Talk. I'm your host, Aaron, here with my co-host, Ange, a.k.a. Captain Party, and our producer, Shar. And over the last 10 years, we've been elevating marginalized voices through interviews and events. Sometimes over a glass of whiskey. But if you're thirsty for more bitches, find us at bitchtalkpodcast.com and follow us on Instagram. A big thank you to 48 Hills and our listeners for voting us Best of the Bay Best Podcast in 2022. And now, on with the show. All right, we are here at CampFest 2023, bringing you a documentary that we are so excited to talk about. It's called Jeanette Lee Versus, and we're sitting down with the director, Ursula Liang, and the Black Widow herself, Jeanette Lee. Welcome to Bitch Talk. Hi. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to go ahead and start with our director here, Ursula. Can you introduce Jeanette Lee Versus to our audience? Oh, well, Jeanette Lee Versus is a story about the icon who also is known as the Black Widow. Um, it's a profile of her life and sort of the ups and downs of the things she's been going through um, throughout her career and her uh, life right now. I, I wanted to ask Ursula, we were, just so everyone knows, listening, we were at the Q&A uh, this past Sunday on Mother's Day. It was beautiful. We were crying. It was emotional. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you're an independent filmmaker and there was something that you brought up during, during the Q&A. Um, I wanted to ask about um, being commissioned uh, by ESPN to do this film about Jeanette and what that's like as an independent filmmaker. It's I, I know you talked about it, but can you tell our audience what the pluses minus is? Are you more stressed out when you're commissioned? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, it's a really different thing. You know, I've done two films as an indie filmmaker and each of those films took like five plus years to make um, and raise all the money for. This was a project where I was approached by a production company called Words and Pictures who had a relationship with Jeanette and her team. Um, they are a production house that um, emerged from people who are working in-house at ESPN. And um, so we kind of knew the destination would be the ESPN 30 for 30 series. And um, what a joy to have something like this land in my lap. It's very hard to tell Asian American stories and you have to do a lot of fighting in the process okay. of pitching an independent film to get people to give you the funding or the space to tell the story. And here, here was this like icon of Asian American history, someone who I looked up to um, had a great story and the money was on the table and the distribution was all set. So um, that was a huge relief for me. I had also had um, a baby. And so the, you know, the being an independent filmmaker means you're doing a lot of like unpaid work. You're taking a lot of personal risks. And it felt very hard to do something like that um, with a child that I'm responsible for. So this was like a huge, huge blessing for me. And I don't know if Jeanette knows all that, but, um, you know, I don't know what I would be doing right now if I didn't have this project to do when I was, um, you know, I had a baby who was really wow. small and I, I really had only a certain amount of bandwidth um, to both be a mother and to be a filmmaker and to make money for my child. I'm a single mom. And um, and so I was really, really lucky for this project to come through to me. And, and what I didn't understand um, as well until I started working on the project is how much support you have when you're working with a full-blown production company. I was working with a producer who just won an Oscar for working on Summer of Soul, the Quest Love film. I think it's on Netflix. Great film. Uh, and mm -hmm. so, you know, she did so much that I was like shocked, you know, I mean, she, you know, <laughs> always like working as a producer director on my own films. And so I'm doing tons and tons and tons of work and not sleeping at all. And she was doing so much heavy lifting that I could have more um, creative time and more time to spend with my kid, frankly. Yeah. On, on that note, I'll turn to you, Jeanette. Were you prepared to have a documentary shot on your life? Is this something you'd been wanting for a while? And uh, now that you're on the other end of it, how has it kind of changed the way you look at your life? I think it's something that's been said to me throughout my whole career is, oh, somebody's got to make a movie about you. Somebody's got to tell your story. You know, you have such an incredible life and story, but it's not something that I ever felt like I had time to really reflect on in terms of the totality of what I had accomplished 
um, keeping in mind all the hurdles that I had to overcome. Those are all things that when you're in there and you're busy doing it, you you don't necessarily take the time to sit back and look at it. And um, just having this movie presented to me was such an exciting opportunity and the relationship that I developed with Ursula and just getting to know her and how she worked and how words and pictures worked was a great experience for me. But I, I also was... You know, just having stage four ovarian cancer just kind of thrown upon me right at that same time. It was to me, it was kind of a blessing in disguise because, you know, when you're looking at am I going to live through this film, you know, or, you know, am I going to live to next month? And you have to think about all those things. The idea that you're going to have kind of a whole production team and amazing movie director and all this support from ESPN and everyone um, to be able to tell my story when you feel like your life could be ending, you know, for me was a, was a huge opportunity and a blessing because I mean, the most important thing to me are my children. And I always wonder about how they're going to look back, you know, and what they might've learned from me and what positive influences that I can have on them, not just as a, a mom, but also just looking later on in their adult life on how they can handle things and lessons learned. And um, I just, I was, I was thankful for the opportunity while really thinking about, okay, how vulnerable do I want to be? How much do I want these cameras? Do I want them in my house? Do I want them in my bedroom? Do I want them looking inside my messy closet? You know, <laughs> And just um, there were so many scenes in there where my hair was all messed up. I looked like I just barely rolled out of bed. I mean, it looked horrible. And of course, I always want to show like the myself in the nicest light. But I think for this movie and to truly tell the story, I think it was really important to be as honest as I could be. And I had to put a lot of trust in in Ursula that she would know where that kind of line is of how to show the true authentic Jeanette Lee and the reality of what she's dealing with while still like not embarrassing me. You know what I mean? I mean, not that she would ever, but I wouldn't say she embarrassed me, but I'm saying myself feeling embarrassed. Those were questions that I had in my head, like, you know, and then I just, just decided to just be as all in as I could be because I thought it was important to the viewer to think about other people. I think that was more important than my own vanity to a certain extent. Jeanette is like incredibly unique and we are so lucky to have had her as a subject who has a real understanding of the media and storytelling. I would say that one thing having worked in the Asian American community on stories is that our community is not super media savvy. It doesn't totally understand how American audiences work. Um, American audiences love to see things that are flawed. They love the characters that are flawed and have some humanity to them. And when I've been filming Asian American characters in the past, they often want to be shown in a very perfect light and they want their best face for it. And I think this is a very specifically Asian American thing, an Asian thing. And so, um, so, you know, that's always like a long conversation and a long um, road to, of trust building with, with um, subjects. And Jeanette from the go- get go was like, I want to be, um, I want to show people the reality, particularly of her suffering. You know, she didn't say it in that way, but, you know, one of the first days we filmed with her, she was really in a lot of pain and we dealt a lot with her sister. Her sister was in from Hong Kong at the time. And we reminded her sister that Jeanette had told us that she wants to be, she needs, she wanted people to see um, how hard the things were that she was dealing with. And so, you know, we, we talked through a lot of points of access and, and we, we, we always knew that we were going to be, we were going to keep Jeanette safe and like in our hearts when we were making this film, but we wanted to be able to have film the material. Sometimes you can't, you know, you're not even let into a room to be able to have the material to make those decisions in the edit. And um, I think because Jeanette is so media savvy um, and really understands how things work and, and just has such like an openness to um, Thank you. you know, those things like we were really, really lucky because I think especially when someone's dealing with such, you know, with such a vulnerable part of your her life, I, I most people, yeah. most Americans, most anybody would want to really close up and protect themselves. And um, you offered like a gift to to audiences, Jeanette, and I'm really thankful for that. Thank I you. Just, 
I do think really quickly, Erin, just, yeah, especially because whenever we saw you, Jeanette, as fans, you were always so put together, so strong, so fierce mm-hmm. to know now through this film what you were really going through physically, isolation wise within your community to realize that you were going through all that and still so fierce and so strong. It makes the story <laughs> that much more powerful. So anyway, love that. Ange. Thank you. <laughs> um, speaking of your sister, there was something that she brought up in the documentary the conversation around generational trauma, specifically in Asian American communities. Just curious if that's been um, more of a conversation now that it's brought up in the documentary, like with fans, with your family. Is that something that's been more kind of open now? Yeah, I do believe so. And there there has been more conversation and the fans have been um, amazing about just communicating to me the impact that it had for them and how they were kind of able to connect. And um, we were talking about how we always want ourselves presented in the in the best light. But the reason why it was important to me to share every side of me and everything I was going through was not so much that I wanted them to know the struggles, not because I wanted them to feel sorry for me or be more impressed by me, but so that they could connect and know that they're not alone. You know what I mean? For them to go, no, this is happening to all of us. And when you see me, it's, it's, um, and what I'm going through, I see you, I get you. I'm looking at the audience going, uh, I, I know where you're coming from. I know what it's like for it to be hard. And I'm telling you, you can do this you know, and to kind of give encouragement through my, um, through the things that I've had to overcome and deal with. Because I think a lot of times we see other people, like she was saying, Ursula was saying, you know, when you look at people on TV and it, there was definitely pressure, I think, over all of these years from my mom and different elders about, you know, watch the way you sit, watch the way you talk, watch what you say. And, you know, all these other things. And I always want to be respectful, things like that. But I, it's, it's for me, it was always very important to, um, to make it clear that we are not perfect people. There are, there are, there just aren't perfect people out there. And the ones that the harder they try, I think to be perfect, the more to me, the more imperfect they are, you know, because, um, they're not real. And so it's very hard to connect with those kinds of people and to learn or gain or offer anything to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, now I want to switch gears and I just want to talk about winning because uh, <laughs> my sisters and I okay. are pool players. And like I said, we grew up watching you. We are pool players. You may have seen me at the dive bar at the bottom of my hill. Um, <laughs> but I want to talk about either something you said when you were a kid, you were super competitive and you say, I just wanted to beat boys. And like for as much as I love pool, I think I just love it for those moments when I just beat this very cocky man that right. thinks that he can, oh, let me show you how to shoot. Oh, let me help you. When you beat somebody like that, there's just no better feeling. So right. I, I'd love for you to just talk about how and why you fell in love with the sport. And maybe you have some good stories of just like beating really cocky men when you were first coming out. <laughs> You know, I'll tell you the truth, because a lot of people uh, when when I was actually first starting, there were, uh, you know, when I say I just love beating men and I love saying that I I there's nothing better than beating a man in stilettos, you know, (laughs) just just breaking balls and taking names. And and I love all that. But I I also um, take into account that uh, like when I was starting, there weren't so many men that were that were um, cocky as in like they could beat me, but it was that here, let me show you how to play. Just that automatic assumption Mm -hmm. that just me walking as a woman, you definitely can teach me how to play. And, and for me to go, let me turn that around a little bit for you. You know, it Mm -hmm. is, it's, it's a wonderful feeling, but I will say that there were, it, it wasn't cocky so much as being disrespectful, but it was, just always assuming that you're just this frail little girl thing. And there's no way that I could figure this out on my own, even though all the men do it Mm -hmm. and the number of men that have said, so who taught you how to play? And I'm 
and, you know, and I could say, well, who taught you how to play? Well, I just started playing in pool rooms and I'm going, me too. <laughs> you know, and that was, that was my whole career. And I would say there's still people that would, uh, men, not really women so much, but, but men that would say, so who taught you, you know, who was the guy that, that taught you everything. And I don't think that that's automatic with guys that play pool. Like who taught you? I, mm-hmm. I never hear people asking those questions or hearing the other male pros being interviewed with that kind of question on, you know, Mm-hmm. But I like it, to it, back it, them. I think that's what we've got to do. We got to just um, ask that question right back to somebody because people, there's so much mansplaining and there's so much. Yes. Um, you get very specific line of questions when you're a woman doing anything, when you're an Asian American person doing anything. Just, just reverse, reverse the uh, point of view and how ridiculous do some of these things sound. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember when I first moved to Indianapolis, and they, you know, there was um, a guy that said. Yeah, you Chinese people really know that math. I know that's why you became number one. (laughs) And I said, well, actually, I'm Korean American. And and he's like, well, you know, it's the same thing. Oh, and I'm like, where are you from? Digging, you You know, and it it just but I, I remember just as I was younger, it would just make me so angry. And that for me, that's changed in the way that, um, you know, as you get older, you start to kind of look at the other point of view and um, and see, you know, what made this person like this. A lot of these people, they're not looking to um, disrespect you. They're just really that ignorant, you know. So instead of me getting angry, I think it's more important that I try to be part of the answer in educating, advocating and, um, you know, saying, well, you know, and taking the time to explain instead of me rolling my eyes and wanting to flip them the finger or, (laughs) you know, things that I might have felt when I was younger. um, Now it's who can, you know, how much more can I talk about my ethnicity or my culture or the way that we were raised and how that fits in America as an Asian American? And, you know, introducing people to Korean food or, you know, the way that we think or or how we behave at home and the differences in the way that our children are raised to respect elders, you know, and look at our seniors in our community. I mean, Mm -hmm. I know with Koreans, I mean, how many, how many, like the the elders, all the respect is on them and they get fed first. Whereas in Americans, a lot of times, you know, you feed all the kids first, but with Koreans, the respect goes to the elders first. And there's a lot of, I think, really beautiful things about um, what we do and what we have to offer that isn't publicized enough, I guess, Mm -hmm. or talked about enough. And so I kind of has slowly switched gears into kind of thinking more along that line educating Jeanette out of the children that you you have which ones want to play pool which ones are curious about your career and and what do you tell them about your career well out of the six children I have I have three still living at home which is my year old my 13 year old and my 12 year old that's Cheyenne Chloe and Savannah okay I also have two my my two stepdaughters who we married when they were six and seven. So they're my babies. They're my daughters and my son, John, who I adopted yes. when he was 14. And um, out of all of them, I didn't find out that Morgan played in an APA pool league till she was in her mid. Uh, let me see. <laughs> Actually, till she was in her late twenties, I think. Wow. And my son, John has <laughs> always played pool. Uh, when I, w- I would go play pool, he would play pool with me or go play with friends. And I think that he please plays in a pool league in New York city there at Amsterdam billiard club. And my two youngest one, the 12 and 13 year old uh, used to, and will be rejoining in August, the juniors pool division that we have oh, here it. in Tampa. Yeah, so I own a business, Tampa Bay APA Pool Leagues. And so adults 18 and over will join a team once a week and go play on a team. And it's social and fun, amateurs only. It's just like joining a dart league or a bowling league or something (laughs) like that. But the girl, you know, the kids, the juniors division, we actually teach them 
how to play, but you also learn about good sportsmanship, teamwork, discipline. There's a lot of positive things that come in that social, the social skills aspect of it is really good for our youth. So yeah, they all, they love, all love it to some, to some respect, but none of them are uh, even remotely as addicted to pool as I was. <laughs> I'm moving, Jeanette. Can I move? Yeah, I know. Anne's going to move to Tampa. Can I play Tampa. a game with you? Oh, what a dream come, come true that would be. <laughs> well, thank you both so much for being with us. We loved this film. We want it to be twice as long. We're waiting for the sequel. Um, Ursula, yeah. can you tell us where we can watch this and, and when it's coming out? Um, it's actually already on ESPN plus. So if you have Hulu, you can click on, you know, search for 30 for 30, the series and add on the ESPN plus to your account. If you don't already have ESPN plus, I think you can watch on the ESPN app as well. Um, it's available to stream right now. It's only 50 minutes. So it's a quick watch. Um, yes, hopefully there'll be a double length one at some point in time. Um, and, and a lot of my friends internationally have been asking me about it too recently, and they have not been able to tap in. So I don't know what's going on with uh, international fans, but, um, if you are an international fan, like keep tagging ESPN and get them to get it out to um, the international folks because people around the world love Jeanette as much as we do. So. <laughs> yes. Um, and if you want more, I hear there's an autobiography coming out. Jeanette, do you want to plug that? I think sometime next year. Yes, actually we're working. I was able to sign a deal with Triumph Books, Triumph Publishing. And so I'm so happy about that because, I, you know, as Ursula mentioned, there's so much more that we would have loved to put in the film. Um, and hopefully, you know, you never know, Ursula, we might do a sequel someday. You know, it'd be nice. But um, th the book is something that, yeah, we've been working on Um actually started this year so hopefully it will be out by next year we'll be done by the end of this year and then hopefully out in the market by next year and i don't know if we mentioned here but uh i still have a lot of people asking me how am i doing now so i am in remission so i just wanted to say that before we say goodbye thanks to uh they they still have me on chemotherapy so i'm taking limparza which is mm. I, I think a fairly new drug but it's kept me alive and well so hopefully i'll be on limparza for the rest of my life and you'll you'll never get rid of me i'll just be around <laughs> Well, you, you're amazing. You're an inspiration, the both Thanks of you. Too. It's been an honor talking mm -hmm. to you. Again, the film is called Jeanette Lee Versus. We've been speaking with director Ursula Liang and uh, the Black Widow herself, Jeanette Lee. Christmas came early. We got to interview yes. our childhood yeah. heroes. So yep. it's been an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks for joining us on today's show. You can find more information about this episode in our show notes. If you're missing us, you can visit us at bitchtalkpodcast.com to sign up for our newsletter and buy us a cup of coffee. Did you know we're also on the radio? You can find us at bff.fm. And lastly, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. All the cool bitches are doing it. is a proud member of the BFF.FM podcast network. Learn more at podcast.bff.fm. BFF.FM, best frequencies forever.